Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. Somewhere in September last year, about 80% of our country's coal-fired plants had a scary movement. They were left with less than a week worth of coal stock against the recommended reserve of 15 to 30 days. It led to the Prime Minister's intervention and an impending crisis was averted. But according to a Business Standard report, we are again staring at a somewhat similar situation. Our next report tells us more about it. In December last year, the Federation of Indian Mineral Industries shot off a letter to the Prime Minister, claiming that the coal crisis was still prevailing and was affecting the profitability of non-power industries. It came three months after several states were hit by power outages due to coal shortage and two months after Finance Secretary T.V. Somanathan assured the nation that the coal shortage was temporary. Now, India is again seeing the emergence of a complex demand-supply mismatch in coal. Both the power generation and the non-power sectors are claiming that the supply is below optimum levels. They have also alleged that the national miner, Coal India Limited, has been supplying bad quality coal. Data available on the National Power Portal shows that at the national level, the current stock of coal at power generation units stands at an average of 9.8 days, which amounts to 38% of the normative 24 days stock. The critical stock threshold is 7 days or less. Power units that are situated away from the mines, but close to high consumption states in the north, west and south of the country are facing a far more precarious situation. Industrial states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka are the worst hit since their state-owned units have an average of just 4 days worth of coal stock. For their part, independent power producers have also been crying foul over the low supply of coal. Sources told Business Standard that in the weekly meetings hosted by the Ministry of Coal, the private units have been complaining since November that they are not getting adequate coal supply. At present, the national average coal stock at NTPC units is 13 days and at independent power producers, it is 9 days. It is not just the power generation sector that has been hit. Over the August-October period last year, most power plants in the country had reported critical stock levels and a severe shortage of coal. As a result, the centre issued an order saying that coal supply to power units should be prioritised. Subsequently, the non-regulated sectors faced a situation where there was limited or even no supply of coal to them. In fact, these sectors still claim to be reeling under a shortage of coal. For example, in its recent letter to the Ministry of Coal, the Aluminium Association of India has said that since August 2021, the non-regulated sectors are being supplied with just 40 to 50 percent of their coal requirement. There were several reasons that led to coal shortage last year between August to October. It was a record hot summer followed by extended monsoon. Power demand also rocketed as the economy opened up after the COVID second wave. Power generators on one end were witnessing high power demand and on the other depleting coal stock. Rains restricted more coal mining and quick transport of coal. This led to power generating units having zero to one day of coal at their end. The centre moved in quickly with several initiatives such as allowing import of coal, changing the methodology of a stocking up of coal at power generation units and prioritising coal supply from Coal India to power units over non-power units such as the manufacturing sectors. But it seems the relief has not lasted long. As the situation stands now, it seems a coal shortage scenario might emerge again. Several power generation units have alleged that they are getting lesser coal than the contracted capacity. At the same time, economy rebound continues and power demand is expected to increase by 5-6% to 6 over last year. The power generators have also alleged that railways are not allotting them enough rakes. There are also complaints of power plants receiving lower grade of coal. 
This means that they have to burn more coal, hence require more railway rakes, which the railway is unable to allot to them. As the summer months inch closer, a tightly knit coordination is needed between coal, power and railway ministry. The power ministry has mandated power generation units to maintain a threshold level of a stock of coal at their end. It is imperative that this is adhered to. Last year, when the coal shortage happened, hydro and renewable energy sources were unable to come to the rescue when the coal units started shutting down. The power ministry needs to ensure that there is a reserve power generation capacity available this time when the, when the power demand touches its peak during the summer months. Record power demand is good news for the economy. Hence, a demand supply mismatch should be avoided at any cost. For its part, the Ministry of Coal has called this shortage a seasonal phenomenon and said that the Indian Railways is responsible for the drop in supply. The Ministry cited the domestic coal supply to the power sector till January 2022, which was 552.65 million tonnes. A senior coal ministry official told Business Standard that this was 26.56% higher than last year and 18.7% higher over the same period in 2019-20. Coal ministry officials also said that complaints from the non-regulated sectors were without any merit. Most experts blamed the heavy rains for last year's crisis, as it hampered the movement of coal from mines to power generation units. While we might not be aware of all the reasons behind the current demand supply mismatch, hopefully the government and all the stakeholders will work together to avert any crisis, as demand for electricity will see further rise in the months to come. Coal not just gives us electricity, it produces billionaires too. According to some reports, coal mining tycoon Gautam Adani became Asia's richest man for a short while, surpassing Mukesh Ambani, the chairman of Reliance Industries. So what is behind Adani's success? What explains his meteoric rise? Our next report offers a peek into his growth path. If India's growth story in the decades after independence was shaped by the Tatas and Birlas, Adani and Ambani have become synonymous with wealth creation in the 21st century. While Reliance Industries Chairman Mukesh Ambani continues to top India's billionaire league table, Adani Group Chairman Gautam Adani is closing the gap with his fellow Gujarati faster than ever. Calculations by Business Standard put Gautam Adani's net worth at $92 billion compared to Mukesh Ambani's $108 billion. But unlike Ambani, Adani is a first-generation entrepreneur which makes his success all the more remarkable. It took just three decades for him to build a group whose seven listed companies command a combined market capitalization of $153 billion today. Edible oil company Adani Wilmar on Tuesday became the seventh group company to list on the stock exchanges. In 1978, at the age of 16, Adani moved to Mumbai to take a chance in the diamond trade before moving back to Gujarat to help run his brother's plastics factory. In 1988, the Adani Group was born when the 59-year-old college dropout set up the group's flagship company Adani Enterprises to import and export commodities. With a core philosophy of nation building, the group has come to be known for its scale and execution. It has diversified into two dozen businesses, many of which are among the largest in India. Here is a snapshot of its seven listed companies. Adani Ports and Special Economic Zone is India's biggest private port operator, with its 13 ports and terminals dotting both eastern and western coastlines. Adani Enterprises is India's biggest coal trader, the biggest coal mining contractor, as well as the biggest private airport operator, with eight airports in its kitty. Adani Green Energy is one of the world's largest solar power developers, Adani Transmission is the largest private sector transmission and distribution company in India and Adani Wilmar is the country's biggest edible oils brand. Adani Total Gas operates the largest city gas distribution business in India and finally Adani Power is the largest private thermal power producer in India. The infrastructure empire is also present in solar manufacturing, logistics, industrial land, defense and aerospace, 
fruits, data centers, road and rail, real estate and lending. Seen as politically well connected, Gautam Adani has emerged as the leader in infrastructure, a sector where many a businessman burnt their hands. Anas Rahman Junaid of Hurun India tells us what is behind the meteoric rise of Adani. From about 2014-2015, when the demerger, the 2015, when the demerger started happening, uh, at that point in time is when the wealth has started to grow drastically, right? Then after that, in 2016, there was a further demerger of the uh, the green and the transmission and the uh, the gas business. So again, uh, if you look at the, the biggest value creation that has happened for Adani Group, which was primarily looked at as an infrastructure. Uh, business, right? It has become primarily an energy, gas, uh, powered grid transmission kind of business. Adani transmission since the demerger, the valuation has gone up by almost 71 times, right? And Adani Green has gone up by almost uh, 64 times. And of course, Mr. Adani has done a good job in terms of focusing on the right uh, kind of sectors, the green energy and gas, and where he thought and got into the right kind of partnerships with international brands like Total and How To, you know, which uh, make the company which is primarily from India, be ready to be accepting global contracts and so on. One common thing that you find across these entrepreneurs, and if you specifically speak about Adani as well, is that the uh, the team that they have, you know, the amount of time and capital they spend on building a second layer team, which is in charge of individual execution of each of these projects. But that is something that have really seen stand apart in these entrepreneurs. They are happy to let the control go to a, a team of experts who can look at uh, and analyze good opportunities and make, make recommendations for investments and you know, uh, so on. So I really see that there is a uh, intelligent uh, way of capital being deployed at right kind of opportunities. The group's expansion has been fueled by debt since it bets on capital intensive sectors. The total outstanding debt of the listed group companies is estimated at $20 billion. There are also concerns about whether the valuations of some of the group companies are in the bubble territory. The collective trailing 12-month revenue of the group's listed stocks, excluding Adani Wilmar, is $14.5 billion, whereas their combined profit is just $1.14 billion. However, the collective market value of the six stocks is $148 billion giving rise to questions on whether the stock prices are detached from fundamentals. Valuations notwithstanding, Adani's recent push into green energy has been the biggest contributor to his wealth gain. Shares of Adani Green Energy have surged over 5,500% in the past three years and at $40 billion, it has become the group's most valued company. Whether the valuations will sustain or not, depends on whether Adani's track record of entering into potential sectors at the right time continues into the future while pursuing his lofty digital and renewable energy ambitions. Fortune is indeed favoring him. Shares of Adani Wilmar, the flagship consumer goods entity in Gotham Adani's stable, hit another 20% upper circuit on Wednesday. Meanwhile, as economic recovery gains ground, global central banks, including the Reserve Bank of India, have their tasks cut to gradually withdraw the liquidity support. However, 10-year bond yields have been rising since the December policy meeting, picking pace after the budget announcement. On the other hand, tightness in liquidity has led to some short-term market rates rising above the repo rate. The nervousness in the bond markets could make Shakti Kanta Das's task even more challenging. Let us see how. Money markets have been nervous since the announcement of the budget on February 1st. High borrowing numbers in the budget, as well as absence of any steps to facilitate global bond index inclusion, roiled the domestic markets, pushing the yield on the benchmark debt to two-year high of 6.8%. This comes at a time when global central banks, the US Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank are looking to hike the rates soon. Bank of England, on the other hand, has already hiked rates. And this edginess in the bond markets may make Shaktikanta Das's task more challenging. India's central bank may stick to baby steps for policy normalization as it is seized by the need to anchor borrowing costs for the government in addition to supporting a durable recovery in Asia's third largest economy. Those objectives could also make the benchmark interest rate a sideshow at today's monetary policy outcome. 
Madhvi Arora, lead economist at MK Global for instance, believes GSEC market shows nervousness around impending policy actions and a possible supply demand mismatch in the absence of RBI. Against this backdrop, even a reverse repo hike or a stance change could disturb the market further. Thus, cautious policy treading and communication will be the key. On the other hand, Joy Deep Sen, an independent market analyst, believes the RBI may think twice before hiking the reverse repo rate today. When RBI takes a decision, they look at so many aspects like you know, what is inflation, how much is growth, all the second wave, third wave and all these things and now this budget thing. So what it means is since the market has already reacted adversely, in the sense yields have moved up significantly in response to the union budget. So even if the RBI were thinking on 9th Feb they will increase at least the reverse rate because the required is the reverse rate they were thinking. Now they will think twice because the market is already jittery. On top of that if they enhance increased rates on 9th of February, it may lead to another this thing, uh, blow for the market. So uh, I'm not saying no to it, but in case they increase rates on 9th of February, they will think twice before doing it. Meanwhile, earlier this week, the government cancelled all bond auctions scheduled for February 11, which analysts said could help soothe market nerves. But a huge supply next fiscal will require the RBI's invisible hand in a more visible fashion, implying return of pre-committed GSEC acquisition program. With these points in mind, let us go to Dhawal Dalal, CIO Fixed Income, Edelweiss Mutual Fund, to understand what the bond markets will be eyeing today. After the disappointing union budget and a consequent increase in bond yields, the upcoming Monetary Call Policy Committee meeting assumes significance. There are essential four expectations from the bond market. Number one, the bond market would like to know from the RBI how they will be able to support the borrowing program through open market operations bond purchases in the new year. That will help soothe the sentiment and help reduce the bond deals from the bond, uh, secondary market. Second is uh, market would like to know how the Reserve Bank of India is planning to embark on the policy normalization first by increasing the reverse repo rate uh, and second by providing a glide path on the uh, increase in the repo rate uh, in the new financial year. The fourth is the market would like to know whether the RBI would like to maintain reverse repo rate as a policy rate or they would like to shift uh, to repo rate as a policy rate uh, by removing surplus liquidity from the banking system. That will help uh, repricing of the short end. Nonetheless, analysts and the street are baking in at most a 25 basis point hike in reverse repo rate along with holding the accommodative stance. Given the policy outcome, market participants should expect a volatile day-to-day with choppiness high in rate-sensitive counters like banking, NBFCs, auto and real estate. That apart, stock-specific action amid Q3 results will also sway the indices. Over 300 companies, including GSPL, Hero Motor Corp, Tata Chemicals, MTAR Tech and m M&M are slated to report their results later in the day. Yesterday, the BSE Sensex advanced for a second straight day and ended 657 points higher at 58,466. The Nifty 50, on the other hand, closed at 17,464. After the markets, let us see how technology is making our lives better. Very soon, you may be able to make digital payments up to a certain amount without an active internet connection. Let us find out how. According to media reports published late in January this year, the National Payments Corporation of India or NPCI has been testing a new solution that will enable unified payments interface-based digital payments without an active internet connection. The new solution, which is called UPI Lite, will arguably be the first one used to enable digital payments under 200 rupees in rural areas. Why is this important? Because many Indians don't have smartphones and the mobile internet connection in rural areas can be glitchy. But with UPI Lite, feature phone users will be able to make digital payments from their bank accounts. Consider the numbers. According to One Financial Daily, India still has about 350 to 400 million feature phone users. 
According to experts, an offline mode for digital payments, especially for small value transactions, will provide consumers with an alternate, secure, and low-cost mode of payments with near-cash type characteristics. This could become a preferred mode for small retail payments. It will also give a boost to payments in areas where internet penetration is slow. To make UPI Lite a reality, two key solutions are reportedly being tested. The first is a SIM overlay and the other is a software provisioned solution that will leverage over-the-air updates. All of this comes against the backdrop of the Reserve Bank of India enabling offline digital payments. In early January this year, the RBI issued a framework that allowed offline payments up to 200 rupees per transaction, subject to an overall limit of 2000 rupees. The aim of this step is to push digital transactions in semi-urban and rural areas. UPI-like transactions will not require additional factor authentication like one-time passwords. That's all we have for you today. For more news and analysis, log on to businessstandard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.